Something big is happening to markets around the world. Big tech earnings just hit the deck and there wasn't much to love as both Google and AMD were down significantly after hours. So today we discussed that and the FOMC. We know that what happens here will have a big impact for markets around the world. But what we really need to talk about is the rotation going on under the hood. A lot of people are missing this and it's truly going to shape what markets will do for the rest of 2024. So as the S&P 500 approaches 5,000 and huge dark pool prints, show a clear inflection point is brewing. Let's talk about stocks and the financial markets together. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Daily Recap Show where we talk about stocks and the financial markets. My name is Chase. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell. Let's get into it. Another day and another dollar for financials as well as energy. Really, they were the best performing sectors as well as industrials. I mean, excluding like freight services who just took a dump and we're going to talk about them yesterday. It was quite a bullish day for industrials as a whole. I mean, just pockets of green and strong, strong volume in industrials. The big names, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, some of these reported earnings, they really got sold off as well as semiconductors as a whole. Software too, half and half dependent on which side you were. But guys, I do think there's some very, very clear rotation happening and we're going to talk about it. But let's have a look at the majors, right? IWM, small caps, down 0.85% on the day. NASDAQ 100, down 0.68% on the day. S&P 500 and RSP is not on here, pretty much finished flat on the day. Look at what outperformed CAR. For those of you that don't know what this index is, small cap quality, okay? Pretty much small cap companies that have a very low leverage, high return on invested capital, and the growing earnings. This is what this index is. That's exactly what we're doing. I was, the, and the reason why this came to my attention is because I hold a a very similar company in my portfolio that just went green in my portfolio after you know my QQ and uh, Google was was red uh, for the day down like four or five percent after earnings. This was the only green one, small cap quality, and we're going to talk about that. We're going to dive into that. So let's look at sectors, and essentially what sectors tell you guys is where are people taking their money from and where are people buying. So what are people selling? What are people buying? And it's very very obvious right now. Financials, energy. That is what people are buying right now, financials and energy. What is the common theme between financials and energy? They're pretty attractively priced. Look at what people are selling. Semiconductors, real estate, technology, a GDX, software, comm services, okay? I mean, regional banks didn't participate, but I'm gonna show you why that this doesn't really matter in a second. People are selling these names, you know, sensitive names for financials, energy. Think about small cap quality. What is in that small cap quality index? It's probably a ton of financial names, a ton of high quality energy names, right? Small cap, and think about the small cap quality index that just showed you the calf. In that name, in, in that ETF, right? It, it trades at like a 16X. Financials trade at like a 13X. Energy trades at a 10X. So people are buying attractively priced stuff right now. They're seeing the indices at all time highs. They're seeing valuations and they're moving from expensive into attractively priced that's gonna grow. Financials are looking at growing earnings after 2024, 10%. Energy, okay, they're not growing earnings. I think earnings growth is going to be about 3%, but it's at a 10 PE. It's priced to grow earnings at like negative 8% for the next 10 years. Stuff like that. We're seeing a little bit of staples and home construction as well. But then we actually have a look at sectors over the last five days. Clearly, without question, okay, we got comm services in there, but energy, financials, regional banks, right? What are people selling? A technology, semiconductors, real estate, GDX. So people don't want this and people want this right now, especially over the last five days. And this is the rotation we've been seeing. And then we go ahead and we have a look at breath, right? 138 S&P 500 stocks hit fresh 52 week highs today. Sectors with the most financials, industrials versus seven stocks with fresh 52 week lows right here. And you can go have a look at this on my Twitter. Uh, you, you can look, go look at the full thing. Sectors with the most lows, three of them are healthcare. And I'm, I, I'm willing to put money on the fact it's probably three biotech names. Willing to put money on the fact it's three biotech names. Breath is in the market. Breath is still strong. It's just that we're seeing rotation, industrials, financial, energy. When we're moving into these stocks that are far more attractively priced because the S&P 500 as a whole is valued at a 20x PE. Minus the Magnificent 7, we're still trading at a 7x. Maybe even with earnings, you look really far ahead into the earnings, it might be a 16x. This is what people want. They're looking at the market, they're looking at attractively priced stocks and that's what they're buying right now. And at the same time, we're seeing consumer confidence, the highest it's ever been since December 2021. We're getting back to these like highs that we've seen post-COVID, pre-COVID highs in consumer confidence. Looking at JOLT data, we got JOLT data date beat. We were expecting 8.7 million job openings. What did we get? 9 million. The report as a whole, jobs quits, top to bottom, really healthy report. Jobs market continues to remain secularly tight. That's exactly what you want to see. And this is for December. This is coming off uh, December into January where job openings tend to plummet. 
based on seasonal adjustments. Again, looking at the size and frequency of layoff an announcements, they've actually declined. So despite what everybody's telling you, we're seeing 12,000 job cuts on UPS. Of course, UPS are going to cut jobs. Amazon took all their market share. I don't know how people don't understand that. They just look at the headline. You go deeper into it. Amazon hired 14,000 delivery drivers in the last six months. The most recent data up to December, job cuts are coming down. And I'm, I'm willing to put money on the fact that it's going to be around this level in January. We get that data next week. Now, looking at present set situation versus the expectation index, this is based on consumers assessment, current business and labor market conditions. It's actually happening. Business conditions are improving. What are the expectations? Staying flat, maybe even going down a bit. There's definitely a, a dissonance with what we're seeing in the data versus what's actually happening. And then we have a look at family's current financial situation. There's improvement, good going up, bad going down. And the reason why this is happening is because real income, real disposable income is increasing. As you can see, it has in 2023. But the forecast cost for real income growth in 2024 is at 3.2% for the year as inflation is actually going to come down 2%. So we had 4% plus inflation last year. We're looking at a number anywhere from 2 to 3% this year. And this is what this represents. So real income is going to grow 3.2%. And long story short, inflation coming down, real disposable income going up. That is bullish for a very strong consumer. And I just don't see a recession coming into the market right now. Let's have a look at credit quality. US issued banks credit cards. This is retail right here. So what are we seeing? Let's have a look right here. This is January 2022. Sort of make our way up to November 2023, December 2023, January 2000. 2024. For the most part, we've seen an uptick in delinquencies, both in 30 days, 60 to 90 days, and 90 days plus. What have we been seeing since November 2023? We've seen, okay, 0.44%, 0.43%, 0.41%. Same year with 60 to 90 days, 0 0.3, 0 0.32, 0 0.31, decreasing as these numbers have actually increased over the last year. Very similar situation to retail issued cars, okay? 1 1.26, 1.19, 1.09, 0.95, 0.96, 0 0.86 falling. We do want to keep an eye on this throughout the rest of the year, but delinquencies are moving lower. And one thing I actually want to show you guys is credit card loan balances. In 2019, credit card loan balances were sitting at about 475. Right now it's sitting at about 425. But you know, you take this number and this number, adjust 2023 for inflation, compare it to 2019. What do you get? I did the math, you're actually at about 410. So in real terms, credit card balances are just less than what they were in 2019 with the job market significantly improving. Very, very bullish when you look at these stats as a whole. And one thing we're also seeing in an election year, not just in the US, throughout the globe, and fiscal policy tends to ease during election years. Increased expenditure, reduced revenue. Long story short, the government spends more and takes less tax money in. They want more money on the table for consumers, for the individuals, for voters, essentially just buying the vote. And we can see here that a record share of the world's population is set to vote in 2024. The presidential system or the parliament system, 40% of the global population will be going out to vote. And a lot of that is Western countries, US, Europe, India, a whole bunch of other uh, countries. At the same time, this is why we're seeing global liquidity bottom out. Don't get me wrong. The reason why we're seeing global liquidity increase is because we are heading into an election year, not just in the US, but around the world and expect this to continue. And it always coincides with an election year. The Reserve Bank they plan it like this. They want to ease during election cycles. And so they'll tighten during the presidency. This is why this long-term cycle exists like this. So what is the typical seasonality for an election year? Well, normally up until election day, it's pretty up and down, very choppy. After election day, that's when it normally comes. Election day, I believe in the US is around November. A lot of the world, it's going to happen around the middle of the year, September, around that time period. But nonetheless, after we get the confirmation of who the party leader is, who's going to be the president, who's going to be sitting in the Senate or the House, then you get your rally once you have your certainty. And this is for the SPX and the stock 600. Now, something that is creating uncertainty certainty is there's troops on the ground. U.S. military personnel in Iraq put on standby to support ground involvement in Israel's war on Gaza. There's a lot going on uh, in the world right now, particularly in the Middle East. Geopolitics is a big issue. And it's not just in the Middle East, guys. China, Europe, Africa, Southeast Asia, Taiwan, and the U.S. has got their foot uh, in every single nook and cranny where there's geopolitics. Now, what does that mean for us as investors? Well, I got you guys the stats, okay? This is S&P 500 market performance during times of conflict. What does the market performance look like? It's pretty average. 
average, in my opinion, 12 months later, 7.21% return, 4.42% six months later. These are the start dates that I've used. Here's something I want to know. This right here, this right here, this right here. Pretty brutal 12 months returns. In the instance of this, this, and this, right, every single one, right here, here, and here, these were recessions. These blue lines are recessions. So if we actually exclude this, this, and this, and look at everything else, very, very positive nonetheless. And we haven't got our recession, and I don't expect to get our recession. People have been calling recession for the last 18 months. Where's our recession? There's no recession. So we're going to play the stats. And what does this mean? Geopolitics really doesn't affect the world as much as you would think it does. It might have a minor shock in, in the first month, as you can see, almost every single instance, maybe except the Gulf War, Cuban Missile Crisis, in every single instance, we normally go lower. Sometimes in three months, we do go lower. But generally, six months, 12 months on, excluding a recession, we're normally significantly higher. And it's quite substantial returns, 10, 33%, 8%, 24%. So just something to go off there. So geopolitics doesn't really affect market returns as a whole, where it can have a minor shock in the short term. Now, let's actually talk about probabilities in the next month. This is S&P 500 performance from Jan 27th to Feb 15th, when the trailing quarter, October 27th, to Jan 27th is greater than 5%. On average, during this 15-day period, average returns 2.3%, 21% of the time up, 5% of the time down. What did we put up in this quarter? 18.78%. So just some stats for the bulls to go by right there. Everything is looking for towards higher price action, including February seasonality. But let's actually talk about earnings. Very, very big earnings today. We had Microsoft, AMD, Alphabet, GM put up good earnings, UPS terrible earnings, Pfizer, a surprise. Profit, MSCI, great earnings. But let's talk about these three. Alphabet, I currently hold stock in Alphabet. Alphabet beat on revenue and they beat on EPS. People didn't like the fact that they missed on search though. That's the big issue. A lot of people think Google's losing market share through to AI search. And that could be true. That might be true. I do think a bit overblown with what happened after hours. But all in all, they beat on revenue, beat on EPS. Really, really good. I, I didn't see any guidance for them. If I do get guidance, I'll put it on my Twitter. So go and follow me on Twitter. But look, gross revenues year over year increase 13.5%. EPS increases 56.2%. What I didn't like though is this right here, free cash flow. The consensus was 15 billion. They missed significantly by 50%, 7.8 billion in free cash flow. And I do know they let go of a lot of people. That only accounted for $2.1 billion in impairment charges. Where's the rest of the 5 billion, Google? What are you doing with your money? What did you spend it on? And I don't really know what they're doing, what happened there, but I'm going to go have a look into it because this is a bit of a red flag when you look at it all things considered. Nonetheless, I think it was good earnings. I would give these earnings from Google an A minus. And look at this right here. Cloud, the biggest driver of growth for Google right now, 27.5%. They beat on cloud, by the way. The consensus was 8.9. Very good. Looking at AMD, it was a bit harder to decipher. Now they beat on revenue, increased year over year by 10.2%. This is beating the consensus, by the way. They missed EPS ever so slightly due to rounding figures, but they grew EPS 11.6% year over year year, but they missed on every other single metric except gaming. They missed the consensus, sure, and a lot was priced in. I do think Wall Street were probably pricing in the consensus because they've rallied 25% year to date. Nonetheless, the company is still growing 10.2% year over year. Now, free cash flow did miss. Now, the company is growing year over year, but guidance is looking not that great. All in all, a hit and miss earnings for AMD. I, I don't think it was bad earnings. I just don't think it was what the street wanted and that's why they got sold off. Now, AMD's biggest growth driver right here is data center, data center revenue, right? Now, AMD's biggest growth driver right here is data center revenue in terms of volume and size, 37.9% year over year increase. Problem is NVIDIA is taking market share from Intel and AMD. And I would give AMD's earnings a B minus, possibly C plus. Now, having a look at Microsoft and impressive, 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 absolutely crazy what Microsoft did. Beat on every single metric. Look at how clean that is. And this company is absolutely amazing. Beat on every metric. Guidance is given on call. I didn't have time to listen to the call guys, but absolutely crazy with what Microsoft did in every segment. Growth. Look at this guys. 17.6% year over year growth. 20.2% growth profit. 26.3% EPS. Can you believe this is a $3 trillion company? Absolutely wild. Now they were flat pretty much in after hours because so much is priced into Microsoft already trade at like 35 X. Nonetheless, fantastic job, Microsoft. This for the size of your company, A plus plus. If I could give you one more plus, I would. 
And we got some commentary from Dan Ives. He said, Microsoft delivers another masterpiece quarter, beats across the board with Azure, number beating the street by 250 to 300 basis points, AI driving cloud strength, use case catalyzing, guidance on the core, but hard to poke holes in this A plus print by Redmond. I agree. I 100% agree. Now let's talk seasonality. We knew know that Santa rally was negative. First five days was negative. What can we expect for January if it's green? We've only ever had four other instances of this, sorry, three, not including 2024. In every single instance when we've had a green January, we've had a very positive here. 100% of the time higher, average return 19.9%. So positive January does bode well for air price action and any pullbacks should be just used as dips to be bought forward. Looking at presidential cycle seasonality, and we can see uh, that S&P 500 returns for presidential cycle year four after 20% gain in year three. This is what we wanna have a look. Presidential cycle year four returns after 20% gain, 15% returns on average in every other instance. It's anywhere from six to 8% returns. There you have it. So all in all presidential election years are quite bullish and we do know why. They try to buy the vote, they ease financial conditions, and generally want the economy roaring into the election. Let's have a look at Gamma. Very interesting setup happening right now. We're seeing huge amounts of 5,000 call Gamma building at this strike, as well as the 4950. The call Gamma resistance has actually moved up to 4950, and we're seeing a lot of call Gamma resistance being built up here at the 5,000 level. We are seeing a lot of weakness in the indices, especially the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ come right now. But according to Gamma on the tape, Everything is still in positive gamma and all dips to be bought as dealers buy dips, sell rips. This could change at any instant, particularly if we get below the 4,800 area where we dip into negative gamma. So if we do form a sell, look at 4,900 and below 4,900, we're going to go to 4,800 very, very quickly because there's not a lot of positive gamma supporting us as well as quite a bit of negative gamma at this level right below 4,900. So something to consider there, guys. S&P 500, uh, guys, losing a bit of steam up the top here, losing a bit of steam kind of weak after hours as well. I think we're starting to rotate. I think that's what we're gonna see. I think we're gonna see down or sideways uh, S&P 500, NASDAQ, maybe a flat RSP. I think we're gonna see a pretty big rotation into healthcare, uh, into financials, into energy, into industrials, away from technology, discretionary. I think that's what we're gonna see. And that's gonna probably bring the S&P 500 lower maybe we just consolidate sideways a correction in time and then we move higher that's not to say we can't move higher uh, at the moment, but that's not to say we can't move higher. We definitely can, but that's what I'm thinking about right now. The call gamma resistance is at 4950. There's very high chances we go there, reach it, touch, then sell off. And maybe if 5,000 starts building, we get some more strength into the tape. But I, I guys, I, I am thinking that we're going to see a rotation. I'm not saying we're going to dump. I think we're just going to go sideways in the S&P 500, maybe like a hundred point range between 40, 4850, 4950 after February, after March, see what the market provides to us. And then maybe we can look for dip buying opportunities. But that's what I'm thinking right now. And I think that's fairly reasonable considering where we are right now, valuations and earnings. But tomorrow's a big day of data. So anything can happen. And a lot's going to be dependent on Jerome Powell's tone. I don't think he's going to pigeonhole himself by coming out dovish. There's a lot of data that's going to be released for the rest of February and March before he can actually make that rate cut decision in March. So I think he's just going to come out probably going to sound a lot more hawkish, maybe a more neutral stance. The thing with the neutral stance is that because rate cuts are done, that a neutral stance is de facto dovish. I think we're probably going to see a slightly more hawkish Jerome Powell tomorrow, and I think the market does expect that. Now, looking at some BOFA charts right here, guys, this cup and handle from BOFA, they see a, a continued upside. They see a pullback to this level and then a measured move up to 5,200, 5,600 on the upper end. One thing that's also in the favor of the bulls, this is the S&P 500 advanced decline line, S&P 500. As the S&P 500 has moved up, the advanced decline line has also moved up. This is a positive divergence and the advanced decline line finally confirms the year-to-date rally. This is exactly what BOFA wanted to see. Now, having a look at small cap quality, guys. So they went and made a uh all-time high uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And we're going again for those all-time highs. Absolutely very, very strong, up 0.46% small cap quality. One of the best performers in my portfolio right now. Let me actually just check. Yes, yeah, small cap quality in my portfolio is up 1.13%. Mid cap 
quality is up half a percent. We're definitely seeing a rotation into financials, uh, into industrials, I believe, into these higher quality names that are attractively priced, in my personal opinion. I might throw this up on the screen for you guys to see. So I think that's what we're seeing. I think we're going to see a rotation. Everything's pointing to that right now. And we, we're starting to see the resurgence of that. We just need to see follow through. This is something the market has been lacking. You know, we, we see this rally in small caps. We see a rally in all of this and for a couple of days and we don't see that extended follow through. But what has we have seen follow through, extended follow through in is big tech. And that's why I do think you need to hold NASDAQ and, you know, take on the volatility and look well into the future. That's what we're trying to do. The economy is good, guys. The economy is good in my personal opinion. People can say inverted yield curve. The yield curve has been inverted for 18 months. Where's our recession? There's no recession. Okay. And I, I do think we're going to see a rotation. That's going to be really healthy. If we rotate into earnings, we're going to start pricing in next four quarters, right? That includes Q1 2025. Stocks are going to be cheaper on a relative PE basis. Now looking at Google, down 1.16 on the day, down about 4% after hours on an EPS revenue beat. But look, this is exactly what happened to Google right here. This was their last earnings call dropped and then they absolutely rallied as a result. Very same situation. As long as we don't break this level right here, we drop, it means we go higher. And if we do break this level, however, that's where things get a bit dicey for Google. Microsoft, flat after hours, not much to say. It's at all time highs. Sure, that's a pretty rough candle, down 0.28% for the day, but it, it, it is expensive at 35x. I'm not sure what guidance is. I, I didn't, I, I haven't had time to look at what guidance could be for Microsoft. But if we do pull back, sure, do expect higher price action. I wouldn't fight this trend. Great company, amazing earnings, and they're still growing at $3 trillion. Now looking at equal weight, guys, this is actually looking relatively strong. I mean, I, yesterday I said we need to go break that high. We didn't close above it. We did wick above it and we're actually sitting above it in after hours. And this is what we're seeing. The equal weight, the equal weight is holding up incredibly strong, incredibly strong. And you, you don't see this in bear markets. And, and one thing I want to add in, in bear markets that, that just come across my mind, look at AMD's, look at, let's go back to Google's earnings, right? They beat revenue, beat EPS, okay, missed on search. This was a bear market. Google drops like 15% after hours, 100%. They drop like 10% after hours. They don't drop like three to 4%. In, in like truly a bear market, Google's sitting at 125 right now. Google's sitting right here, you know, 120 right now. You know, very much the same thing with AMD, especially with AMD. In a bear market, AMD drops to like 133. AMD drops maybe to these lows right here. I mean, AMD drops like 30% after those earnings in a bear market. They only dropped like 4% after hours. So now going back to the RSP, listen, I think this looks strong. I think this looks very, very strong. We're consolidating. We're building a, a good base of support right here. We just need a close above this level. We do that and we can go attack 160 all time highs. Looking at AMD, guys, and, and exactly like I said with Google, in any situation, right? And if this was truly a bear market, if the, the market was really concerned about future earnings with what AMD did, they wouldn't be down 4% on the day. They'd be trading here at 133 at the support level right here, right here. They'd be down like 12, 15% on the day. The market is not really concerned with the economy. The consumer is strong. The economy is going good. Play the cards as it is right now. And I do think if let's say AMD does move down, we could look at 145 and then 133 as potential areas of support to load up on shares. Starbucks earnings were very mixed, but they bounced because they were quite undervalued compared to what they, they occurred. I think China and Starbucks is kind of bottoming out. A lot of things to like in this earnings report, a lot of things not to like too, but the market seemed to kind of like the direction Starbucks is going. They've had, had quite a bit of trouble, but all in all up to up 0.3% of the day, up to percent after earnings. Um, I, I think we're probably going to see more price action into Starbucks, but I think the market probably wants to see more strength in China before anything will really happen for Starbucks in the future. So looking at the tenure until Jerome Powell actually cuts, until we actually see the federal funds rate drop, I think we're just going to move in between four and 4.2% in the tenure. I think that's what's going to happen. Sure, we might just go a bit above. Sure, we might go a bit below, but we're going to trend in this section for the most part. Looking at financials, it's breaking out. It's breaking out. That is a very, very strong candle. I think it's going to go for 40. This is a very strong chart, particularly from here. And I think with where earnings in financials are going to look at, with where earnings are going in 2025, I think we see further strength. You know, we're only trading at a 13x, 11 times forward for financials. We're very, very bullish on the XLF and financial sector as a whole, especially the big names. We're looking at Visa, MasterCard, SPGI, MSCI, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs. I think these are going to be the winners in this run over the next two years in financials. Looking at energy, it's retaking this line right here. I think if oil continues to push up, so too will energy companies. But with the rotation we're seeing, I think we're seeing some very, very good strength. And have a look at this right here. This, this price action looks very similar to what we saw right here. And I do think we probably go 
can at least take out this eighty-seven dollar, this eighty-seven level. That's what um, energy needs to go do. Take this level out, take this level out, and then let's go look at ninety-two. A lot's going to depend on oil prices and what's going to happen in the Red Sea. Now, looking at healthcare, it needs to break above this red line convincingly, close above to move higher. Other than that, I think we're going to continue the rotation between one thirty-seven and one forty for healthcare. And guys, just something I wanted to show you guys on the third of January. By the way, it's the second if you're in America. I said XLF, XLV, XLK are my top picks, sector picks for 2024. So I gave you guys a lot of alpha on the 1st of January. And if you had invested equal amount in all of these, you'd be up 4.5% today, by the way. Absolutely crazy when you think about it. That's a lot of alpha for just one month. Data tomorrow, the big one is the FOMC. We just want to see what Jerome Powell's posturing is. And then we do get ADP employment. Normally a pretty good proxy for what happens in non-farms, but nothing really too exciting there. All in all, everything on the FOMC rate decision. We know what's going to happen. They're going to hold. It just depends on the rhetoric coming out of his mouth. But if you've made it up until year, guys, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell. Cheers.